So does it work? Yeah. Flip forward button backward? Yep, perfect. Great. So we're set. Well, hello and welcome to my talk. I will talk about intention based RNG in games. RNG is an acronym for random number generator. Uh, you probably heard of this before when a speedrunner talks about, yeah, in my last run I had a bad RNG. This basically means uh, they were unlucky. Uh, it didn't work out how they hoped to, to make the shortest run, like not having the drop they expected or the game was just longer than they hoped when they play, for example, Splunky and words were created that didn't work out so well. Um, at first, we'll talk about why I care about random anyway, because, well, it's random. And later, we'll come to my conclusion how to improve individual luck for a better experience. And this is what I will call the ritual. This is the concept I worked out for this. So why random anyway? Um, it, there is a big difference between luck and rewarding games. And players have the feeling they, they want to get lucky. They don't only want to work for something and know what they work for. It's, it, it feels like work. If, if you know you do this task and get this, it's work. And these predictable rewards, they just feel less special. And when you add something to this, you expect to get from, for example, fighting a certain boss, you know, uh, I get this and this treasure there, and I get something at additional, and I don't know what it is. This is exciting and it's luck based. And for a game developer, this is quite easy to implement because we just have to run the random number generator and generate whatever we want to put out. So because this is physically, this uh, feels the, physically a reward feels like a compliment. So a lot of good rewards of uh, being a lot of lucky feels like getting a lot of compliments. This has the downside that um, uh, you can get addicted to this because uh, dopamine drop out. And this is basically the main problem of gambling. Uh, it's this striking for getting lucky, this feeling of being lucky. And also when you have a random number generator, balancing is a big question because you not only have to make the players happy, uh, but you also have to keep them encouraged and keep playing. So you must make the drop of the loot or whatever so that it's enough to feel satisfied and feel lucky, uh, but it must not be uh, so much that the player now has everything and there is no, no more need to play. And in general, um, random drops, when it is a weapon or something in a competitive play, it can be, uh, it can devalue the skill. So there can be a very good player who has a bad RNG fighting against another player and he loses because of bad luck. You maybe notice in Mario Kart, this is, there's a lot of luck involved and well, there, there are strategies like in Mario Kart, maybe you, you don't wanna be first, you want to be second because the blue turtle hits always the first one. So a random number generator can also be very exciting because the outcome is unknown. And this generally keeps a game fresh and gives it a high replayability. Uh, you notice from the roguelike games, this is a uh, genre in itself, which means uh, every run is different and you don't really finish the game, you make this run and if you survive till the end, you completed the run and you can then start the game again. And it's, it's not the same. It's procedurally generated differently with other difficulties you have to overcome them. And now I come to my inspiration and why we have always talked now here about fantasy magic. I took my inspiration from real magic and I was looking here at chaos magic. You can tell this is real magic because it's, it's stylized with a K. And a short explanation about chaos magic, it's a modern approach on classical magic. Classical magic is what you know is uh, this bohemian approach with uh, costumes and these ceremonies. And uh, chaos magic uh, goes a different approach. They see themselves as a magic that just works. It just has to work. and how it works isn't uh, so much important. You just have to have an idea about it, how it works. And I quote this sentence here. So through the magical act, 
the practitioner modifies the probability that the desired phenomena to happen by itself. So in chaos magic, you do not, uh, you aren't able to, to shoot fireballs because the probability to imagine that you are able to shoot a fireball isn't not that high. And this, this wouldn't really work. And I found this book here, Liber Chaos. This is by Peter Carroll. Uh, he is a founder of what was called uh, Illuminates of Thanatos. Uh, this is a real life magic guild, if you want so. And it was founded in 1970 or something. And he came up with this formula and now bear with me, I know formulas are scary sometimes, but this is actually quite simple. It multiplies a few values, values that are between zero and one. And then we calculate with standard probability uh, how likely this will happen. And as variables, we have the state of gnosis. This is how much the practitioner can get in this desired state. This is a mental state and it's maybe comparable with meditation. And then there is a magical link. This is also called entanglement. And this is how related the, the practitioner of magic is with the effect they want to achieve. And there is also uh, some negative effects that hinder a positive outcome. This can be the state of awareness. This means um, it's, it's a negative value. You want to make it very, very small. Also, there is a subconscious resistance. This is when you come to the idea, well, actually this is all nonsense I'm doing here. Well, it doesn't work. So you, you have really belief in it. And what this really then gives you is a formula. And um, you can now say, well, we have this calculator here that calculates a magic probability. The problem is uh, how to value the state of gnosis or how strong is your magical link between zero and one. This is in real life quite hard, but we will see later in a game, we can actually work with these values. And uh, about this chaos magic in general, it's a sometimes phenomena. This means it's not really reproducible. And also stuff like the placebo effect uh, or self-fulfilling prophecy uh, are counted as magic in this scenario because the chaos magic doesn't care if this is now a placebo effect or if this is called uh, whatever else. As long as it works and brings the results, it's magic and does its job because it was uh, evoked from the mind. And there was also some interesting uh, research. I want to quote this shortly on the SRI. This is the Standard Research Institute in 1970s. Uh, this was actually funded by the CIA and uh, they have now declassified the information. What they did was remote viewing. It's like, um, like clairvoyant to, to spy on Soviet targets and the Soviets had their own version on it. And there was an experiment on Princeton Engineering Anomalous Research Lab. Uh, they had a number generator and they tried to predict the outcome of it. And what they came up with is some 5% uh, success, which is, uh, if you want, uh, statistically significant. However, their work uh, was faced with harsh critics. And um, they were like saying, well, they did diocese as first, and they said, well, diocese aren't really random. Later, they did atom as a random number generator. But overall, uh, critics say, well, they do bad maths, they do bad statistics. And what probably counts most, it wasn't possible to reproduce their results in other experiments, countless other experiments that were done later. People who still are in favor for Princeton, however, say, yes, of course, because it depends on who does the experiment, which, well, is understandable for experiment that deals with consciousness and mind in itself. So sadly, for now, as you might be aware of, there is no hard uh, physical or scientific evidence for magic being real. But what we can take away from this is um, the consensus that with a certain probability of being effective, Magic creates reality by means of intention. 
now we'll set up a scenario here with how to get a pirate treasure. In reality, as both in Chaos Magic, we have this prehistory. So to, to find this, let's say, treasure in your garden, there has to be first an act of someone getting the treasure. There has to be a lot of booty and the booty isn't spent and then it was secured until it finally ended up with you. So you can imagine there's, there's hard to find an outcome how this, this happens. And also in, in Chaos Magic, there, there's not really a way to touch this scenario. In Chaos Magic, for example, uh, you, you wouldn't even want to uh, do this because there is so, so much that can go wrong. You want a, a smart, short effect. Just one example, um, if you want a good grade in a test, it's not so good if you do the magic to, to get a good result, because if you're bad at it, it's hard to uh, trick the teacher into giving you a good mark anyway. Uh, the approach would be to go far ahead. And uh, when the, it's not decided, just that there are questions you're familiar with, so you get easier questions. That would be a chaos magic approach. But back to uh, games. Well, in games, we don't have this uh, prehistory anyway. The, the treasure gets just spawned. It has to be balanced to be worth something, but not too much and meet the player expectations. For example, if you fight a big boss, you want a, a big, big reward. And uh, if it's just on the side, you, you expect it to be small. And you have not this backstory that in reality exists, which for immersion maybe should exist and so sometimes uh, developers just stick a note to it. Uh, basically, you find this treasure and there is some letter with it that explains a little history how the pressure ended up here. So it does not feel random, even it was created randomly in games such like Sea of Thieves, where I took the screenshots from. So uh, when we have now this luck, um, I looked at it and I uh, noticed you, you can differentiate between intrinsic and intrinsic and extrinsic num uh, generator modifiers. So in the, in the left picture, this is from uh, Final Fantasy II, you see there is a value luck. And even though this is a fantasy game, it, it plays in a sci-fi world, it, it doesn't really deal with magic. However, this luck modifier, if you, you think about it, it, it's really magic because um, it, the more you upgrade it, and this is a skill you can learn, uh, the more likely are your critical hits and the more likely are you able to evade them from enemies. On the other hand, we have this lucky charm. This is an example from Divinity Original Sin 2, where you can either craft or find magical items that when are in your position, uh, increase the loot you get. Here we have this lucky charm that gives you plus two. And it not only gives you more gold, this means the number generator that spawns the gold increases when you use it, but also the quality of weapon drops increases. Then I took the idea and wanted to see, well, we have kind of different uh, number uh, generators and what they are truly about. And at first there is the true, the, the secure one. This is um, usually the atom based one that is totally random. It's meant to be unpredictable and it's used in online roulette or poker for money. And uh, if this is a good casino, so they even publish the numbers they pull so everyone can see, yeah, that, that's okay. That's really random what they put out. But that's usually a uh, a lot of effort to make real random generators and it's only used for security. There's also in cryptography, you also want in cryptography real random. Uh, we come now, which is a sub form of the RNG, that's the pseudo RNG. We have this in most video games. It's uh, basically a seed uh, we get from the internal clock and then put this into a formula that spits out a random random number, which isn't really random, it's pseudo random, but because we're humans, we don't really notice this. And it's good enough uh, to balance and create procedural words that appear random to most players. 
And then there is the sequential, that's the predictable. In some cases, we want it predictable or have no other chance to do it. Uh, there were old slot machines. Uh, you put in money there and the, they gave you money back directly in bars or something. And those machines uh, weren't actually random. They were sequential. So if you had a device that uh, had all these sequence recorded, you could go to such a bar uh, play a few games and you would be know where in the sequence you are before the next big payout. And the interesting thing is that there were then interviews with, with people who were gamble addicted. They knew about this, um, but for them, it wasn't about earning the money. Uh, they, they didn't use it because they wanted to, to feel this lucky. And it was also used in old games. Um, because the system clock wasn't such a thing. So they couldn't really uh, pull random numbers and they just replay the sequence. And today this plays a big role in speed run. This means a number, a random number generator hack. If you know where in the sequence you are, you can predict what your next item drop will be. And there are then some tricks like opening a few menus and just like waste uh, random number generations so that when you fight this boss, you get exactly that random drop you wanted. And then the last subform, and this is where I think it, it's getting interesting, is the bias. It's, it's not just pseudo, and it has also a, a certain bias to something. This is in a role playing games, and these are the adjustments via the character and items I mentioned before in the intrinsic and extrinsic. And then is uh, this when, it, when I, as a player, can intentionally modify uh, the random number generator of a game. This is what I would call a, a ritual. And what this requires is having a conscious game, means it's uh, a game that understands what the player wants it to do. And I'll come to my conclusion, which is the ritual. This is the intentionally modifying random number generator. As a goal, I see here, uh, it's a game mechanic that requires adequate amount of time, similar to brute force towards desired outcome, but being more enjoyable. The idea is I don't want to touch any balancing because developers surely thought a lot about it, but I want the approach to brute force something to have a certain drop more enjoyable. For example, if I want to fight this uh, lizard boss, that spawns very, very rarely. Uh, as a player, usually I just go there and try and retry and retry, and that, that's not really interesting. So I come up with this uh, formula uh, derivated from the formula you remember from the, from the chaos book. And I use this as variables. P, this is the probability that's the natural natural occurrence, this is as the game designer would have planned it. Then I would have the effort performed. That's the ritual work. And that's something you can call a dedication to the task. For example, if this boss is a lizard, um, maybe uh, killing a lot of lizards uh, steadily increases the chance to make this boss spawn. Then there is also a possession of ritual relevant items. These items can be shared. This means uh, you cannot only be dependent on them because otherwise you would just hand them over. But this should also be something you can work on getting these items. And there is also negative factors like the penalty from uh, contracting character development, affinity or different guild association, for example. If you skilled your character differently, you you get the malus from this and also time penalty that is shrinking so the longer you try the, the easier it gets for you and to close this down i would formulate this whole concept of the as to offer a task and obtainable or craftable items to increase the likelihood of a desired random event to occur and i'm closing uh, with the uh, sources i have here uh, if you're interested in this uh, CIA uh, spying experiment, I can recommend this documentary, Third Eye Spies, or the, the book uh, Limitless Mind by Russell Targ, who talks about this. And the 
however disputed Princeton engineering experiments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk. Um, I just have a look. We have two minutes, actually, if there are any questions from the audience. Markus has uh, the hand raised. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, Frank. Um, I have one question. You uh, glazed, glazed the topic of addiction a little bit. And this, of course, uh, uh, random number, number generators play a big role in, in a lot of free-to-play games as well. Come back, uh, get a connection to my topic here. Yes. And it's uh, it's interesting because you mentioned that humans don't really notice uh, the implementation of seed RNG, for example. What they do notice, however, is if a game uses true random, a true random gen generator, because it is perceived as unfair. Because true randomness, and I'm stating this uh, as uh, someone who read a few books about it, uh, to you as an expert, so, so I'm, uh, I'm rather asking it. In my, as far as I know, is uh, uh, there's clustering. I mean, if you, it's possible that I that I roll the dice and there's four fours in a row. If, yes. I, if that happens in the game, this by many players might be perceived as crooked or unfair. So um, uh, I see that your solution to this uh, is to make this ritual, with, which is kind of a formula. But then the question to me is, um, is the, the term of randomness not somehow misleading? Yeah, it, it's, it's not actually randomness. That's why I called it bi biased. It's pseudo, it's a, I have this on this chart. I, I can't show it now, or can I? Can I still share? Let me share. Yes, um, but we just have one minute. So. Okay, yeah. sharing, sharing quickly. A quick share. Can, can you see it, the, the chart? Yeah. Yes. It was just a, so we have this true random number generation and a sub a division of this is the pseudo and a sub of pseudo is biased. So you're right, it, it's, it's not, not really random. It's, it's even pseudo and it's then biased. It's going, going down the ladder. But what I think is in the benefit of a better gaming experience. 